It is my great pleasure to be here tonight, and I think timing is perfect because um, you are done with your dinner and you're ready for desserts, and I'll be talking to you about baked goods. So um, the, my objectives for tonight are to, to compare the components for diagnosis of plant and non-plant food allergy, and to analyze clinical case scenarios to develop a rational approach to component allergen testing. So it's really sharing my uh, patients uh, from clinical practice. Um, I will not uh, spend a lot of time uh, uh, discussing uh, this slide because uh, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Uh, Balmer Weber uh, have really beautifully outlined um, the differences between the pollen cross-reactive and non-cross-reactive uh, food allergens. But I want to point out to you that uh, in addition to um, uh, seed storage protein um, uh, in peanut, there are proteins uh, in cow's milk uh, and um, in hen's egg uh, that are um, belong to the class one uh, food allergens that are highly um, uh, stable to, uh, to processing and they are primary uh, gut sensitizers, but there are differences in, uh, in the individual protein uh, sensitivity to heating, which uh, may be explored uh, through the component uh, uh, result diagnostics um, uh, for a baked uh, milk and baked egg um, diagnosis. So um, Barbara has really uh, uh, discussed this uh, in great detail. I just uh, also want to point out uh, that we have, in addition to peanut uh, and hazelnut, in the plant food uh, allergens, uh, soybean um, have been uh, investigated as well as wheat. And uh, in soybean, uh, GLI-M4 is a classic BETV1 cross-reactive uh, PR10 uh, protein that is associated with milder reactions, whereas the GLI-M5 and GLI-M6, which are pollen non-cross-reactive, have been associated with more uh, severe uh, systemic reactions. Uh, the same is true for wheat, uh, where uh, sensitization to omega-5 gliadin has been identified by multiple studies uh, to be associated with more uh, severe reactions. So clearly there is a gradient of uh, 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 increased potential for systemic reaction uh, with uh, highest risk uh, being associated with sensitization to the pollen non-cross-reactive uh, storage uh, proteins. But, um, this is really what I want to talk to you uh, tonight, is uh, whether we could use components for uh, improved diagnosis of non-plant food allergens, uh, and I will focus on cow's milk and a hen's egg uh, allergy. Um, and I think uh, my reading of the literature is at this time there is no conclusive evidence that molecular diagnosis is superior to whole extract testing for diagnosis of unheated milk and egg allergy. However, um, the components may have a role uh, in diagnosis of baked milk and egg allergy. And why is that? It's because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, different fractions uh, of uh, allergens in milk and uh, in uh, egg white have different susceptibility to heating. And the heating makes a big difference uh, for uh, a certain, uh, for proteins that are uh, susceptible because it will destroy conformational um, uh, epitopes. And, uh, Therefore, it will abrogate the binding to those conformational epitopes, um, and this will be associated with milder uh, form of uh, allergy uh, to both milk as well as egg. So uh, I want to show you our studies that we have done looking at the effect of uh, temperature uh, on the casein of a mucoid. And on the left, uh, you see um, a beautiful uh, uh, page uh, analysis. Um, of milk uh, uh, that was boiled for up to 90 minutes. And you can see that this is the, uh, I guess I'll not use the mouse. So you, you have to see there are casings, you know, those very dark uh, uh, spots, uh, and they're present throughout. So this is from zero to 90 minutes of boiling at over 95 centigrade. Um, and so the casings persist, so they are very hardy, they're very uh, 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 resistant to heating uh, compared to uh, um, whey proteins, beta-lactoglobulin and al uh, alpha-lactalbumin, you can see that those bands are pretty much gone after uh, about uh, uh, 15 uh, to 20 minutes uh, of heating. So this um, is a basis of uh, hypothesizing that uh, patients who have higher levels of Ig antibodies to caseins will be more likely to react to baked uh, milk um, than those who have predominantly antibodies uh, against um, uh, the whey proteins. Similarly, uh, for the uh, egg white proteins, uh, the major allergens of mucoid and of albumin are shown here in the, uh, this time, this is an immunoblot. And you could see that compared with the unheated, the heated mucoid has a uh, similar uh, sort of binding intensity. Uh, in contrast, you could appreciate that uh, 
unheated uh, ovalbumin has binds uh, uh, much stronger than ovalbumin that has been heated uh, for a, a pro prolonged period of time. So this is really the sort of uh, rationale for uh, using um, why the uh, uh, component resolve uh, diagnostics might work for uh, uh, improved diagnosis of baked milk and uh, egg allergy. So our studies have determined that um, a majority, up to 70% of milk and egg allergic children, tolerate uh, extensively heated or baked milk uh, and, uh, in the form of a muffin. Um, and that tolerance to baked milk and egg precedes tolerance to unheated milk and egg. And that mil baked milk tolerant children have milder allergy than those uh, uh, children who react to the baked milk. Um, and furthermore, even more importantly, that adding baked milk and egg to diet appears to accelerate tolerance to unheated milk uh, and egg. So this is um, a, a clinic, important clinical uh, situation or, or problem uh, that we actually uh, could help our patients uh, in management. So uh, Jean-Christophe Cobay, who is now uh, back home in Switzerland, was a research fellow uh, with us, and he looked at the data um, that we've collected uh, in the uh, large uh, prospective studies uh, of uh, baked milk diet in children. Um, so uh, two studies uh, combined number of patients, 225, that were prospectively evaluated with oral food challenges uh, to the uh, baked milk. And um, we've measured the Ig antibodies to whole milk, to uh, casein, and to cow's milk, uh, Ig uh, cow's milk. And um, you can see uh, in this receiver operating curve, as beautifully explained by Barbara, uh, that uh, the black line, uh, which is uh, the uh, casein Ig, um, looks a little bit better than the um, uh, cow's milk, which is blue, or uh, significantly better than uh, the red line, which represents beta-lactoglobulin IgE. So those differences were statistically significant, uh, and we proposed uh, some uh, positive decision point for casein IgE or 20.2 kilo units per liter, which were associated with more, more than 90% of clinical reactivity. Optimal decision point with casein of 4.95 kilo units per liter, um, where there's uh, sort of optimal clinical uh, uh, situation of offering the challenge. A negative decision point with the casein of uh, 0 0.9 kilo units per liter, when the vast majority of the children will tolerate egg, uh, uh, milk in the baked product. So this is uh, just uh, comparing this, uh, showing it in a little uh, bit different way with uh, more detail for you. Uh, but um, uh, in our experience, uh, this uh, cut point of about five uh, kilo units for casein IgE um, has a, uh, a very good negative predictive value and uh, as well as uh, acceptable positive predictive value. So we use it uh, to qualify the children uh, for the baked uh, milk challenges in our office. Um, and you can see that a similar uh, uh, cut points could be derived for the cow's milk specific IgE, and they're significantly uh, higher than for the casein uh, IgE. So we think that this is uh, actually clinically very helpful um, and uh, to increase uh, the um, indication for the oral food challenge, the baked milk and baked egg. Um, I want to show you the data on the uh, use of ovomucoid IgE for the diagnosis of baked egg allergy. Uh, this data is uh, from uh, the Japanese colleagues, uh, and, um, but it's sort of similar to what we have observed in our cohort of patients of 100 uh, children with uh, egg uh, allergy. Um, so in the Japanese study, there were 108 children with a median age of 34.5 months, so those are young children who all underwent double-blind placebo-controlled food challenges uh, with the heated egg that was uh, cooked at 90 centigrades for 60 minutes, uh, as well as with the raw uh, egg. And uh, you can see on the, uh, in, on the A graph that uh, uh, the, there is really um, no um, added benefit from using um, a, a diagnostics uh, to uh, ovalbumin or ovomucoid over the uh, whole uh, egg white IgE, uh, shown in the uh, green uh, line, which is actually performs better than any of the components. But when you look at the heated uh, egg, um, uh, challenge, you could see that uh, the blue line, which represents a specific Ig to ovomucoid, uh, has a better uh, performance than uh, either the whole uh, egg white IgE or uh, ovalbumin um, IgE. So from that study, a positive decision point uh, was uh, proposed as 10.8 kilo units per liter, so more than 90% of children 
who have this uh, ovomucoid Ig uh, level will have a, a reaction during the uh, challenge, so we would uh, defer a challenge. A negative decision point was proposed at um, 1.2 kilonewtons per liter, so it means that more than 90% of the children who have uh, a dead level or less will tolerate a baked uh, egg during the challenge. So I think this is quite uh, useful uh, clinically, um, and uh, we've been uh, using it uh, to improve diagnosis of our patients. So before I proceed farther to discuss the specific cases that I've seen and evaluated in my practice, I just want to refresh, my, refresh your memory on um, uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hamilton has uh, explained uh, in detail. But let's just uh, uh, remind you that uh, we have uh, different platforms for evaluating the components. So what we have available now for individual specific allergens um, that, uh, or the whole allergens is immunocap assay, which uh, we all know very well and we are familiar with the uh, units. It's very uh, uh, quality, uh, quantitative uh, assay. Um, and most of the studies uh, discussed by uh, Barbara uh, were uh, performed with using this uh, immunocap platform. But there is also immunocap ISAC, which is the immunosolid phase allergen chip. This is a protein microarray, which uses uh, whole proteins. Um, and um, it has been used extensively in the studies, but it can be uh, also uh, helpful in clinical situations because there are, there are a number of uh, components that are available on the uh, Isaac chip that are not yet available uh, through the individual uh, immunocap uh, assay. And finally, the future uh, is really um, the peptide microarray chip uh, that um, uh, instead of the whole protein, uh, there are peptides that are representing all uh, IgE binding or any antibody binding epitopes on the uh, major allergens uh, of the um, milk, egg, peanut, and shrimp. Uh, this assay has been, has been um, developed um, at Mount Sinai uh, in our lab. Uh, it's very promising, um, but uh, it's still um, not ready for clinical application. So um, I want to now go and discuss the uh, cases that I have seen uh, in my practice. So patient one is the patient, um, 10-year-old boy who has allergic rhinitis, um, has had no reactions to peanuts or tree nuts ever, but he's always tested positive because his older brother is uh, allergic to peanut. The family is from Thailand and they travel frequently and uh, he has uh, passed the peanut challenge uh, 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 in our office at the age of nine years. So now they're very interested in the hazelnut challenge. So we've performed skin testing and you can see that the skin test is uh, similar to the, uh, or equivalent to the histamine. Then we look at his um, IgE level to the whole uh, uh, allergen and you can see clearly that this boy um, is very allergic to birch uh, pollen uh, with the birch uh, IgE over 100. He also tests highly positive to hazelnut over 100 kilounits per liter and he um, no longer um, tests uh, to peanut uh, even though uh, in the past he has had positive uh, results. So normally we would not consider a challenge in this case scenario. We would feel that over 100 uh, Ig level is strictly prohibitive and we would never risk a, a, a severe allergic reaction. But now we took advantage of the components. So we've um, got the components for this child. And um, if you can see the uh, most of the entire uh, the entire, I will not touch this again, the entire um, uh, uh, result is driven by this uh, core A1, which is uh, the uh, birch uh, uh, tree cross-reactive uh, component. Um, and there is really no, um, in, at that time we only have availability for core A8, which is lipid transfer protein, which has, is associated with a little bit increased risk for um, ser more serious reactions. So um, this is just to remind you that the core A, um, one and CORE-A2 are those birch tree pollen cross-reactive components. Uh, so the CORE-A1 CORE in this child was uh, entirely responsible for the uh, hazelnut IgE results. So we chose to perform a hazelnut challenge in the office and he has done very well. He passed and is very happy about it. So now um, his brother is now 14 years old. He's got allergic rhinitis as well as asthma and he's been actually getting shots for his pollen allergy. So his uh, younger brother has passed peanut um, uh, oral food challenge. And it's the same situation. They would love to know if this older boy can tolerate peanut because they frequently travel and this is a big uh, problem for them. But he's different. He has had prior reactions to peanut. He has um, had vomiting with some uh, um, uh, chocolate that contain uh, unknown nuts. 
Um, and we know for sure that he had had nausea and vomiting in um, several years back, with, uh, specifically with peanut. And he also had a itchy throat and vomiting uh, to cookie with peanut. So he has uh, more uh, solid evidence of clinical reactivity. When we performed a peanut skin test, it was very uh, impressive, significantly larger than histamine. Um, so then, but we still were quite hopeful. So then we look at his uh, immunocup IgE to whole extract. Um, he actually did pass a hazelnut challenge some time ago uh, in the office. But when you look at peanut Ig, it's really very high. And it's actually increased from 2009 to 2010 and, and beyond. So um, we look at his, uh, hazelnut, uh, his peanut results uh, components and his RH1, RH2, and RH3 are all detectable. And specifically, RH2 is very high. So we don't really know what over 100, over 100 is high. But we don't even know what over 100 means. It could mean 101 or 200 or 300 kilounits per liter. Unfortunately, we don't get dilution results. Um, I also want to point out that uh, in his case, um, RH8 was also positive, and he. Um, so it's not uncommon to see uh, sort of this uh, coexisting uh, sensitization to birch pollen cross-reactive as well as seed storage protein, which uh, makes this diagnosis even more uh, challenging. But uh, in any case, this was really uh, sort of cementing our diagnosis to not to challenge this child and uh, recommend continued strict avoidance of uh, peanut uh, in his diet. So this is one of the more recent cases that I think are quite interesting because this is a three-year-old uh, Indian girl with multiple food allergies. She had moderate severe persistent uh, eczema and allergic rhinitis in the spring. She's avoiding peanut and tree nuts, sesame and rye in her diet. Um, because based on testing, she, uh, she didn't have any uh, uh, clinical reactions. And her father is actually a physician, and he's um, heard that uh, diagnosis of, of uh, uh, food allergy is not perfect, that there's a lot of false positive, and uh, he's very interested in um, uh, doing challenges for his daughter to determine her uh, true uh, uh, allergy. So uh, we do the... Uh, conventional uh, immunocap testing, and you can see that this child uh, is, uh, she is sensitized to all of the tree nuts as well as to peanut at pretty uh, uh, significant substantial levels, but she also has uh, sensitization to birch uh, at this 28.1 uh, uh, kilo newton. So we think uh, there's still a possibility that at least some of that result is driven by the uh, birch cross-reactive uh, components. So this is just the result of the skin test, which we usually, or I usually perform for my patients um, uh, before making a decision about the challenge. So you can see that she has a, a significant strong reactions to peanut, um, uh, but, uh, as well as to hazelnut compared to the histamine. So we uh, uh, wanted to investigate it further, so we sent, uh, sent components to peanut. And you can see that her peanut, uh, whole peanut Ig is 19.8 kilojoules per liter. And just to remind you, usually we use a cut point of 15 uh, to uh, defer a, a peanut challenge. So this is really uh, consistent with this uh, cut point. But I think what's interesting is that when you look at the components, you have Rh1 at 3.9, Rh2 at 1.0, RH3 at 0 0.11, and she had no uh, evidence of RH9 or RH8, so those uh, pollen cross-reactive components. But there clearly there are other components that are driving this uh, peanut IgE level. So we are not testing for, um, uh, in this child, we are not testing for the uh, relevant components. So this points the, um, to the limitation of our current testing. We don't really, we're not certain that we have identified all of the relevant components. And also, um, I think that it may be uh, Im important to take uh, into the account the ethnicity of the patient. There could be uh, some genetic uh, susceptibility um, uh, associated with this that is uh, different. Because this is quite atypical. This is a, a different you know, pattern that I see usually among my patients. So we also wanted to look at hazelnut because we know that with hazelnut there is even stronger, um, the higher chance that this is a birch uh, pollen cross-reactive uh, result. So uh, here we get the result of uh, hazelnut complete IgE. It's 14, and um, she is core A1 uh, negative. She's core A8 negative. Um, um, interestingly, filbert, um, I don't know if you know that, but the filbert is an old hazelnut uh, test. So before uh, Fadia and now Thermo Fisher improved their hazelnut test, um, uh, it, it used to, you know, it, it was not uh, as sensitive for the detection of the uh, uh, core A8. Um, and uh, 
sometimes you will see a big discrepancy between the Filbert and the hazelnut IgE testing. But in this case, interestingly, those are almost uh, identical. So we actually requested uh, to see um, uh, the results of, for the CORE-A9 and CORE-A14. As you heard from Barbara from European studies, those two were uh, really uh, uh, identified as uh, uh, components in hazelnut associated with more severe um, and more systemic reactions. So um, we found that she had uh, quite elevated levels to both CORE-A9 at 4.5 and to uh, CORE-A14. And indeed, um, those are the, uh, uh, again, just to remind you about the hazelnut, those are the components that uh, can be associated with more severe reactions. And um, it's interesting to validate those observations from European cohorts in our own patients. So uh, this is uh, data from uh, Jacob Catan, who is our fellow, who presented this at the uh, college meeting in Baltimore last year, and the manuscript has been submitted for publication. Um, and um, this uh, the title of the article was that hazelnut reactivity is better identified by component testing than traditional testing methods. This was actually a retrospective chart review of all food challenges to hazelnut uh, that were done at outpatient, uh, our outpatient uh, allergy practice uh, over three years. And uh, it was not, uh, based on allergist clinical impression um, and uh, a number of clinical uh, uh, characteristics were reviewed and then the uh, specific Ig levels to the hazelnut components, CORE-1, 8, 9, and 14 uh, were measured. So these are the results summarized in the table. Uh, they were 116 patients, 107 of them passed the challenge, uh, 9 of them failed. There is no difference uh, among the patients who passed or failed regarding the uh, skin, te skin prick test result, although patients who failed tend to have uh, a larger wheel, but not impressive at all. Hazelnut IgE was um, actually higher um, the, among those who passed the challenge compared to those who failed. Uh, so, but when you look at the results of the uh, uh, compo hazelnut component testing, which was available, which were available for a subset of the uh, patients, um, core A1 was not different. Uh, which is the BED-V uh, cross-reactive component. Um, core A8, lipid transfer protein, was really not detectable, and this is quite typical for the patients in the US. Very few patients I've seen that have uh, 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 core A8, uh, in contrast to Southern Europe, Spain, and Italy, where this is one of the major uh, allergens. However, when you look at the core A9 and core A14, you see that there are significantly uh, higher levels of uh, those uh, Ig to those components uh, among the patients who fail the challenge. So it seems that uh, this is really confirming uh, the uh, European data. Um, and uh, Jake concluded that when used together, a cutoff of two kilounits per liter for CORE-9 or one kilounits per liter for CORE-14 yields a sensitivity of 92% and specificity of 93% in predicting hazelnut reactivity. So um, this is uh, quite instructive. So the fourth case is an older college uh, student with uh, asthma, allergic rhinitis, and food allergy who is avoiding peanut, tree nuts, raw celery, and raw carrots, but he eats um, uh, soy, apple, cherry, as well as other plant foods without any problems. He does have history of uh, peanut allergy, at, but very distant. At three years of age, he had uh, some nasal swelling and cough um, with cracker jacks that contain peanut. Um, and he didn't even receive any treatment by the time he got to the emergency room. Um, and he has a history of eating peanut butter before many times, um, uh, but, uh, and he uh, used to eat some tree nuts uh, before. And then he also had a, a clear history of, uh, of reactions with the birch uh, pollen cross-reactive foods, the uncooked celery uh, as well. Um, uh, he uh, also sort of eliminated uh, carrots uh, after having a reaction to celery just because they read, uh, the, the, the family read that carrots and celery frequently uh, um, cross-react, uh, so, but he never had a reaction. So this um, patient um, has uh, had skin testing done, uh, and you can see that his peanut uh, skin test is uh, quite impressive versus carrot and celery, but this is actually quite um, not uncommon because for the uh, um, oral allergy symptoms uh, that are due to those highly labile and heat uh, unstable uh, uh, sensitive uh, proteins, um, some of them are being lost during the uh, al allergen extraction. So you would have to do a skin prick test with the actual raw uh, food, so either uh, carrot or celery. And then I'm sure that the uh, skin test reaction would be much, much higher. 
So he actually came to us with the results of the um, uh, Immunocap Isaac that was ordered by his uh, primary uh, physician. So just to refresh your memory, it, this Isaac chip has 112 uh, component uh, uh, protein components from 51 allergens, and it's a mix of both uh, native uh, purified as well as recombinant components from food, epidermals, and animal proteins. Um, so this is a, sort of a set panel of allergens. You cannot customize this. You cannot cherry pick which ones you want. Um, and it, it's a semi-quantitative, as Dr. Um, Hamilton uh, explained before. So um, you, you get semi-quantitative, uh, qualitative data, and the units uh, are different than your immunocap unit. So you cannot really translate the result from Isaac to the results from immunocap, and you cannot certainly use the cut points from um, the immunocap uh, to Isaac. But the, um, the Isaac uh, tests for some of the components that are not available through uh, uh, immunocap. Um, and um, also, this is how, how those results look like. I don't know if uh, many of you have uh, ordered Isaac, but it can be a little bit intimidating. Um, but they are very well uh, uh, organized in terms of the, you know, uh, telling you which are the uh, cross-reactive protein and uh, which are the pollen um, or, or specific uh, uh, not proteins. But the point is here that you know, he has no RH1, 2, and 3. Um, this is actually an older study. Currently, you get RH6 also um, with the Isaac chip. So this is, um, and uh, RH6 is uh, not available of, um, and has been identified as an important uh, component for some patients. But you get results from soybean and wheat, whether you want it or not, so you have to be uh, ready to sort of uh, discuss those results with the patient and be aware of that. But um, it clearly shows that this patient doesn't have any sensitization to storage uh, seed protein, that he's sensitized to uh, birch uh, uh, at a pretty good level, and that he has a um, high uh, level of uh, IgE to the birch cross-reactive proteins in apple, uh, peach, as well as so uh, soybean, which he eats, by the way, as well as peanut and celery and carrots. So we recommended our, our food challenge to peanut butter in the office. This hasn't happened yet because he's away in the college, but this would be the normal sort of uh, uh, course of action for this kind of a patient. So another case is a, is a younger boy with a peanut allergy, mild eczema, and reactive airway disease. He has no other food allergies. He uh, eats all tree nuts. He has a mild history of peanut reaction. At two and a half years, he has had itching mouth with Reese's peanut butter cups, and he was diagnosed with peanut allergy based on testing, so he's been strictly avoiding peanut and has had no reactions. But now he is getting ready for kindergarten, and the mother is very interested in reevaluating his peanut allergy situation because this is a life altering diagnosis. Um, this is really uh, uh, very inconvenient. Um, I, I don't have to emphasize this in this uh, a crowd, um, but uh, it's very important to have an accurate diagnosis. So we do a peanut skin test, and we're not so um, uh, excited about this test because usually we would like to see it smaller than the histamine, but it's a little bit larger. Then we look at the results of the IgE uh, to whole peanut, and you can see that it, it's acceptable. It's 1.25, actually went down uh, from a year before, uh, and just to... Um, you know, just give you an idea, we would usually use a cut point of, uh, of uh, uh, two kilojoules per liter to consider a oral challenge to a child who had history of the reactions, of clinical reactions, and a cut point of five for those who didn't have history of the reactions. So then we thought, well, you know, it's looking promising, but let's look at the components and see whether those will also help our decision making. So we actually were, I was quite surprised because I, um, I got the results of a positive for RH1 at the low level, RH2, RH3, and RH9 and RH8, as well as uh, carbohydrate cross-reactive determinants were undetectable. So at this point, um, you know, based on the studies that have been reported, we felt, I mean, I felt a little bit uneasy about offering a challenge to this child, but then um, I thought that, uh, and the mother was uh, very uh, uh, interested, so we actually proceeded with a challenge, and this child has passed a, a peanut challenge. So I think the story is still um, evolving. You know, what are the cut points? As Barbara mentioned, it's not a question of positive, negative. It's like with a whole peanut um, Ig or any other food Ig. We need to develop the cut points and um, uh, probability curves to really know how to utilize those uh, uh, results uh, clinically. 
And uh, this another case um, will also illustrate our current limitations. So this is a 15-year-old teenager with food allergy, asthma, and allergic rhinitis. She's got mild persistent asthma. Uh, she's on a maintenance medication. She's been avoiding peanuts due to uh, history of reactions as well. All tree nuts. She's never ingested uh, them. She had a recent. She had a reaction long time ago, actually seven years ago, to peanut during a supervised oral food challenge. It was mild anaphylactic reaction. And she also has developed uh, oral allergy syndrome to raw uh, carrots, apples, cherries, and plums a few years ago. So um, now she returned after a, a pretty uh, long time um, uh, hiatus uh, to our clinic and wants to um, readdress the issue of her allergies. So we do skin testing, and uh, those are shown uh, here. And we, I didn't even do skin test to peanut at that point because I wasn't sure what her level was. Uh, and she had uh, uh, some small positive re re uh, results to walnut, almond, and hazelnut. And then you can see her um, uh, IgE results to the uh, uh, just conventional uh, immunocup testing. And you can see that she, she is uh, a positive to birch tree pollen, she's positive to hazelnut, and she's positive to peanut. But her peanut IgE level actually went down uh, from 2004 to 2012 somewhat. Um, and, uh, um, and she was uh, quite low to walnut as well as almond. So we uh, decided to perform our food challenges to almond and walnut in the office, and which she passed. So this really en sort of encouraged us to look into the peanut situation, and we sent the component testing, um, and uh, her peanut IgE was 1.8, her RH1 and 3 were undetectable, um, but she had a low level of RH2, 0.17, and a um, significantly higher level to RH8, the birch cross-reactive component, and 1.75. So we felt really, you know, this is a good uh, um, uh, setting uh, to perform our food challenge. Um, so we did this, and she, unfortunately, after ingesting the entire uh, two or the dose of two tablespoons of peanut butter, developed an uh, anaphylactic reaction with um, wheezing and uh, urticaria and facial swelling. Um, and with recurrence of symptoms uh, within three hours. So this uh, case, I think, um, illustrates the limitation of the uh, component testing. And one of the possibilities why um, we didn't, you know, we didn't identify this uh, 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 patient at risk for anaphylaxis is that maybe we haven't measured RH6. Maybe she has had uh, positive RH6. And in the study by Asarnoi uh, from Sweden, which Magnus said it was the only patient in the whole Stockholm who had the RH6 detectable, this is um, maybe th that was the case, that uh, RH6 is a homolog of uh, RH2. But obviously, uh, there is a, it's a homolog. It's not identical uh, protein. So um, there could be, uh, it could be relevant for uh, some patients. Or maybe this uh, RH2 of 0 0.17 was relevant for this child, whereas the RH2 of 0 0.34 was not relevant for the other younger boy who was overall not that allergic and didn't have such a convincing history. So I think this is really the clinical judgment here is, is very, very important. Um, another possibility, I think another thing worth mentioning is that um, this, all of those studies that have uh, uh, evaluated the utility of RH2 and, and pointed out that it improves the accuracy of peanut diagnosis also identified that uh, there will be a, it's not, it's not perfect, that there will be patients that will be misclassified or misdiagnosed uh, if we use just the RH2 um, for um, making this diagnosis. So in the study by Deng from Australia, 19% um, of peanut allergic infants uh, had react reactions during the challenge uh, with the undetectable RH2 uh, level. And uh, those are some examples of those patients, um, individual patients, and uh, you can see the line that represents the, cut po the, the lower limit of detection that was used for that study. But you could clearly see, and I hope I can use this mouse right now and then skip my slide. No, I can't. So, um, so the, the, the the dark bar represents RH3, okay, believe me. Um, and uh, so if you could lower the limit of detection, you probably were able to pick up some patients who had R, uh, I'm sorry, um, not the black bar, um, the, this, the middle bar that is uh, stripes um, is RH2. So if you could lower the limit um, of detection, you would probably pick up some of those patients. But also you could see that most of those patients who uh, had uh, reactions uh, had detectable whole peanut IgE and were also sensitized to RH1 uh, or an RH3. So I don't 
the current studies really focus heavily on RH2, and this is really the dominant major allergen for peanut, but it doesn't say that there's no role for measuring uh, additional components, and, and there will be patients for whom uh, this would be extremely helpful. So this is, I, this is the last case, um, uh, but it was very, I think it's very, uh, very interesting and gratifying. So this is another teenager who has seasonal allergic rhinitis and asthma, and um, about a year and a half before she presented to our clinic, she started having itchy mouth with raw carrots. And these reactions are classic, you know, five to 10 minutes after eating, she's got swollen lips, blisters on the tongue and throat itching. Um, and, um, and it's also pretty typical that uh, she reported progression of those symptoms um, with uh, similar uh, symptoms uh, occurring with green peas, peanut butter, actually, and um, she hasn't uh, tried any uh, other nuts. So, she was actually tested by her allergist and she was found positive to peanut and she was told she is very allergic to peanut and she was uh, given EpiPen and she was recommended to avoid strictly all of these foods. So since she has eaten peanut butter all her life without any problems before, she's really unsure how um, uh, accurate this diagnosis is and whether she's really at risk for having a severe anaphylactic reaction to peanuts. Because usually when you are told you're allergic to peanut, you have to s avoid uh, all of the products that contain uh, traces or maybe processing the same facility. So this is a huge uh, uh, sort of practical problem for our patients. So he comes for a sec she comes for a second opinion and we run the immunocup to whole extract. And you can see she's very allergic to birch uh, uh, pollen. Her birch IG is over 100. So this is sort of confirming our uh, clinical history. We look at hazelnut, she's also very high to hazelnut, but her peanut is not, um, uh, compared to hazelnut, is much lower, but still, the peanut um, level of 8.04, um, for our sort of class, typical case scenario, we would not consider challenging this, uh, this uh, patient. We would say, well, you have history of reactions, your peanut IG is over five, let's wait, let's sort of, you know, defer that. Um, but um, this time, we uh, could uh, take advantage of the components, and we um, looked at uh, the components, um, and you could see that her RH8, which is birch tree pollen cross-reactive, is over 100. So it's very, very high. So um, it's, it exceeds the, the results of the whole peanut, which is uh, actually not uh, uncommon, but she was totally negative to RH1, 2, 3, and 9. So this really encouraged us to perform a challenge, and she actually passed an oral food challenge, and it's, she's been very pleased with that, and will probably proceed with the hazelnut uh, component testing as well as challenging to component uh, uh, to hazelnut. So in summary, we all know that for food allergy, measurement on food specific IG is an important test for initial diagnosis and follow up reassessment. And then specific IG to individual uh, uh, component food allergens have superior accuracy for predicting mild versus systemic um, as well as more severe phenotypes of food allergy. Um, but clinical judgment remains crucial. At this point, we really are uh, working to uh, better define the cut points and really uh, what are the uh, important components. So you can use them, but you still have to rely on your clinical acumen. And it is really our uh, hope or the expectations that uh, component testing will enhance the accuracy of laboratory diagnosis and will encourage food challenge testing in patients who have uh, no specific IG to components associated with risk for systemic reactions. This way, helping our patients who are falsely positive, falsely diagnosed um, to improve their quality of life. And on the other hand, to eliminate unnecessary challenges in patients with uh, low specific IG to whole, whole food extracts who have specific IG to components associated with systemic reactions. Thank you very much.